Unhooks Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. You're going to hear some perspective tonight that you may not have heard. In 2016, Hispanics voted overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton. You know that. It was 65% to 29%. That's a 36-point gap. It's a big spread, no doubt about it. But to hear the media tell it, no Hispanics support Donald Trump. His racist rhetoric turned them off. They'd never vote for him. You're about to meet a young woman who blows up every stereotype you may have ever heard about the so-called Hispanic or Latino voter. Let's get started. Carla Moreno is the daughter of Mexican immigrants. She grew up here in Arizona, a young Latina. She has lived and worked in D.C. and Mexico City alike, and now believes that President Trump is uniquely poised to take on and resolve the immigration crisis, something that neither Presidents Bush or Obama could accomplish. Carla Moreno, our guest on Newsmaker Saturday. Great Hello. to see you. Hello. I was taken with your story, and um, I want to start at the beginning. Sure. President Trump's announcement that he was running and stuff of the, of the border came up, and he said this. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. When you heard that, as a Latina woman, what did you think of that? I mean, your, your parents are from Mexico. So when I heard that at the time, I remember thinking, this is, this is so insane. I didn't take his candidacy seriously, like most other people. Um, and I just, I never, I, I, I never really gave uh, candidate Trump at the time much consideration. I never thought he, like, and, and again, uh, seeing what was portrayed of him in the media, seeing the way polling was working out, even throughout the primaries up until the general election, I really never thought that President Trump, that candidate Trump at the time could be elected president. What, how did your, how did your position on him and the immigration issue evolve? So, uh, well, fast forward from at election night, I was actually living and working in Mexico City. And I remember uh, once the results came in, and I was, I had voted for Hillary in, in 2016. You voted for Hillary. I voted Clinton. for Hillary. And I remember being so emotional, being so, I, I was, I didn't even go to work the next day. I was so torn up about it. Oh, and you then, were one of the triggered people. Yeah, I was. I really was. And the the next day and and I, so i just because i was living in mexico i was able to really quote unquote escape political chat and i was working in the private sector I so i didn't say, really need to see politics day in and day out but uh, you were devastated by the result i was yeah enough that i was emotional about it right and i think you and many other people yes and um and you know a week weeks went by months went by and it was all i, I remember that night feeling, oh, all of these terrible things are going to happen within the next months, right? We, there, every major news site, every major commentator was making all of these predictions as to what was going to happen within Armageddon. the next few weeks. Oh, yes, terrible. And it was kids at the border. It was kids at the border. That was the catalyst for you to kind of have a political conversion. Yeah. Well, that, Tell I think, me what happened. I think that really, that, that really crystallized a lot of my um, opinions or questionings. So this is last spring, late spring, and I was seeing the news, just watching the news, and I remember being so, again, triggered to the point of tears. Because of the family because separations. Because of the family separations. At the border. Yes. We've got some video of that. Um, we'll show it as you're talking. So you saw that, and what, what did it bring out in you? What happened? I just remember thinking, this is not America in 2018. Children being separated. Children from their being separated. How can we? And at this point, I, I was already, I was starting to warm up to President Trump's uh, presidency. I wasn't necessarily buying too much. I was getting tired of a lot of the identity politics uh, played by the and catching on to them by the Democratic Party. Again, uh, being in such proximity with a lot of principal of Hillary's team from 2016 and other senior Democratic members, I just. I was already having that line of questioning 
And so now, I'm, I, but at the same time, I'm so triggered by this, and I don't know what it is about this uh, family separations issue. It probably brings up your own. Yeah, well, it, it just made me. It made me think if you know if, if things had gone differently in my childhood, if it had been, you know, I, I, I very could well have been in a in a you know, in a different situation, I could have been one of those kids. Right there, yeah. And Do you think there should be border security? Where I am now, yes, absolutely. absolutely. A but for the people in the interior who are already here, what do you think should happen to the 12 to 20 million who may be here, who are here already? I think that there are two, you know, there, there's, there's two really big questions when we're talking about immigration, right? We have border security and we're dealing with border crime and insane amounts of human trafficking and real crime, very, uh, very scary things going on at our border. And then we're also dealing with, you know, an, an estimated anywhere from 12 to 20 million um, illegal aliens in uh, around the U.S. Now, when you use that term, your Latino brothers and sisters must go crazy when you use the term illegal alien. Yes. You use it. I'm I surprised to hear it. you say that. Yeah, I do use it. I, and I, I think a lot has to do with that. That would be something where, you know, I mentioned earlier, people would say, you're not really Mexican or you're not really whatever. Because of the positions you take? Because of positions that I take or they, they assume because of uh, my career or my education or what have you that I, I'm somehow, um, you know, I get... I'm an exclusion. And I love that experience, as I was telling you earlier, that line of questioning, because I get to say, you know, I'm 25 years old, and I've lived and worked in Mexico City and in Washington, D.C. alike. My first spoken language was Spanish. I now, of five languages, I speak Spanish and English. I can write, read and write both perfectly well. I have, you know, I've engaged my Mexican heritage. I've gone back and, and, and engaged that part, and I mm -hmm. love that part of myself, but I am an American citizen. Okay, so tell me why you believe President Trump, despite some of the rhetoric that people have really balked at and objected to, why do you think he may be in a unique position to solve this issue where other presidents who've talked a good game haven't been able to do it? So I think that after, uh, you know, the fall, we saw a lot of people and back and forth of, with the conversation around criminal justice reform. And I was watching that closely. And to see how, you know, we had President Obama, someone who took a lot of flack from the African-American community and lobby there, who didn't really feel he did much for, after eight years in office, he didn't do much to touch this, the issues of recidivism and high crime rates and so many young black males just being in this perpetual mm -hmm. cycle. criminal cycle. And so to then see supposedly this hyper-racist, um, minority-hating president be the one to really go in and, and, and propose their own bill and push that through both parties as at a, quote, hyper-divided time in our political history was so hopeful for me was incredibly hopeful, and that for me showed that President Trump, um, he, every, every candidate who he endorsed in the 2018 midterms won, right? And so the, the, the Republican Party is now following President Trump's lead. It's his party. It is his party. And you think that's to, that's to the benefit of the Republican Party, strangely? I think it's to the benefit of any group of people who any any voting bloc within the Republican Party, President Trump is going to listen to that. When you talk this way, what happens to well, other Latinos who listen to you? Do you take flack for taking I'm, that position? Yeah, I, I really do. And you I take think, heat. I take a lot of heat, and I think people assume my intentions or my heart or... Again, they, they, they question my, my background, and they say, well, you don't, you, don't care about, you don't care about our people, you don't care about immigration, you don't really care to do, and I absolutely do. My, my positions are not in spite of my heritage or in spite of my experiences, they're because of them. Does his rhetoric bother you sometimes? So if we go back to, you know, we started this segment mm -hmm. talking with the 2015 clip at the time, I was totally, again, you know, turned devastated. Off. Turned off. Angry. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that's, that's, he must be crazy. He must be, he must not be thinking about so what he's doing. So you have come full circle on this. Yeah, well, I think I understand that President Trump uses language in a very specific way, in a very specific way. And um, I, if we look at a lot of 
President Obama was an incredible speaker, right? How they gave these incredible speeches that, you know, can move a crowd and, and get emotional just sitting there witnessing history and what have you. But then you look at what, and myself, if I'm gonna speak to my Hispanic and Latina heritage, I look at how Hispanics were doing and specifically under the immigration issue, under President Obama. And then I look at what's actually going on with actual policies in, under President Trump. We have Hispanic unemployment at record lows, right, in, in, in over decades of history. We have incentives, tax incentives for Latino small business owners to go out and really build a new kind of, of an, an empowered uh, engagement in the, with the country. Do you believe that that Hispanic voters may be coming around to this, or do you think there's, it's just, an, it's a really heavy lift to, to have most Hispanic voters vote for a Republican? I think it's not so much a Republican, but it is President Trump. I, again, I understand how hard and how harsh his rhetoric comes across and what it seems to be saying. Uh, but in my, my engagement and in my, it, with my, my advice would be to look past and beyond the words, right? Look at how, look at your taxes, look at your financial position, look at your opportunities um, and, and, and how you're doing today. So a Latina woman, 25 years old, who voted for Hillary Clinton, you're gonna vote for Donald Trump in, in 2020? Well, we're, we're looking at the, if we're looking at the, at the Democratic Party, Right. If you look at, I think they're up to a little over 15, close to 20 uh, candidates. You look at that pool, and I don't feel myself represented by, I, I mentioned identity politics earlier. And growing up, I never really bought the whole, you know, because I can speak on behalf of you because I am a woman or because I am Latino or Latina. You balked at identity politics. For a while, yeah, but I always, I always felt something was weird about that. Mm -hmm. And now I don't, because of my experiences and, and, and you know, the constant questioning, of, you're not really this, you're not really that, that doesn't, that's not what I'm looking for. That, that kind of signaling isn't what I'm looking for. And I feel that that's really dominating a lot of, most of the Democratic Final Party. question, and, and we've got to move on, but Carla, I appreciate you coming in, Carla Moreno. Um, is this a conversation that rarely is had in media, the one we're having right now? Yeah. Absolutely. This perspective, you think, is not being covered at all? No, no, I don't. I don't believe it is. I think it's counter narrative, and after my experiences, I think that the uh, most senior Democratic leaders and politicians and activists have it has been to their advantage to keep the Latino community, whom is voting principally on the immigration issue, to keep them uh, on a leash. Right, where it's this tug and pull, like we care about you, we are the ones looking out for you, um, vote for us, vote for us, vote for us. And it's really upsetting, and I think that's, it's unfortunate that that's the way the media keeps pushing that narrative, where you will only hear about topics spoken from one very specific angle, and you'll have one person talking about it from one specific angle. I appreciate you sharing your perspective with us. Um, and it's one, again, that, that you don't hear very much, and I appreciate you doing Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Carla Moreno, political strategist. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday. Thank you. And back on Newsmaker Saturday, pleased to be joined now by Dulce Matuz, who was an undocumented Latina, a dreamer who was brought to the U.S. as a child, but she put herself through college, partly through scholarships, graduating with an electrical engineering degree. She has some very interesting insights into the long fight over illegal immigration. And by the way, in 2016, became a U.S. citizen. Good to see you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see you. Um, as we're watching what's happening in Central America, Central Americans flooding here, coming to the border, how do you see that as having gone through this? Is it, I think you, you came here as a 16-year-old? Yeah, I was 15 years old, and I think we have a responsibility to make sure that as a world, first world country, that we solve problems. Not, this is not just something that is happening here in America, but we have seen how 60 million uh, people have been displaced because of 
po poverty, because lack of opportunity, uh, because of violence. And I think we have a responsibility to solve these problems and look at this in a humanitarian way and to be able to solve it. Is there any limit on how many people we should allow into the country? Is there, in your mind, is there a point where our own sovereignty as a country is also important and has to be honored? I think that uh, the sun rises for everyone. And as Christians, we should be able to look at this and say what's best for everyone. I think we live in a uh, economy that it's worldwide and we can make it work for everyone as long as we, we put our minds to it and we leave the politics aside. Is there, is there a point though where, I mean, there are, there are people from all over the world who would want to live here. Is there a limit on what the U.S. can, can handle? I think that uh, that's why we have disagreements and with everyone in the world, in the countries. And we, we can see countries that have open opportunities for immigrants because immigrants bring ingenuity, immigrants bring diversity, and this is why America is so great because of the diversity that we have had for such a long time. And we shouldn't shut the, our doors now because we have people in power that don't believe that immigrants are good. Let's show some video of uh, tape number two here. This is some, some of the stuff happening with Central Americans who are coming here. There are a lot of folks in the United States who say, you know what, we can't accommodate this kind of flood of, of immigration. Um, even historically, it would be completely out of the norm of, of what we've seen historically coming to the U.S. Would you favor completely no border at all? Do away with borders? Would that be a tenable situation? What I do favor is common sense. What I do favor is being humane. What I do favor is that we need to look at our immigration system as it is now and realize that it doesn't work. I think that we have agreed with that. And we also, I'm in favor on listening to the constituents who have said that they support uh, people like me. Over 70% of Arizonans support dreamers. Over 70% of Americans support dreamers. And we are no different from now. So if you look back when I was a 15 year old uh, person, there's people that believe in, in me at Carr Hayden uh, High School. My mm -hmm. teachers believe in me, my family believed in me, and I was able to excel. And I think this is what America provides and we have to expand that mentality to the entire world that uh, other countries can also thrive like we have and be able to create the opportunities that we have here everywhere else, but not by shutting down and not by creating fear. Do you believe there has to be a process though that's lawful? That, that there has to be a process that people can come here, but there has to be a process. You can't simply improvise and come into the country. I believe that we have to have a process, but we also have to recognize that the process we have right now does not work. No doubt about that. And it has to be updated. Like we update everything else, uh, we have to update our phones. So we have to update our immigration system the same way that we have updated our um, uh, tax law. So we need to be an, a, a, a country that is gonna have to update this because we need to be world leaders for other countries to imitate us. Okay, Dulce, if, if you were in charge, what, what would the immigration system look like in the United States? If you could wave a magic wand and say, here's what would work. I've seen it, I've done it, I've been through it. Well, the one, number one thing that I would start by is by passing the DREAM Act. That is something that is a no-brainer. And I also will, you we, would think it is a no-brainer, but the politicians can't even figure this out. That legislation is long overdue, and in my mind, uh, it has already passed in 2010 because we had the majority of uh, uh, senators with 55 votes to pass it. But there were some logistical techniques that we had to overcome, like the filibuster, and we needed supermajority. Um, and, and then in 2013, the Gang of Eight had it in the Senate with bipartisan support, went to the House. John Boehner, who was a speaker at the time, never put it to a vote. Uh, we have become a nation of the gridlock, where we no longer are able to solve problems, we're not able to compromise, and we're not able to move forward. It is more uh, 
beneficial for politicians in power to not solve this kind of issues, even though that most Americans already agree. You're saying Democrats and Republicans, both parties. You and think both parties don't want to solve it. I believe that both parties are to blame. And that's why we have seen an increase of people that are um, independent because they don't want to belong to any specific party because they don't want to solve problems. They're more concerned on staying in power and benefiting themselves than actually listening to their constituents. Let me, let me play tape number uh, five. This is Donald Trump at CPAC talking about this border situation. Take a listen. We will defend the American way of life, and we will always defend America's borders, because without borders, as I've said many times before, we don't have a country. Um, I think when Republicans hear that, they hear law and order. When you hear it, what do you hear? I hear that uh, we have been doing the same thing over and over, just throwing money to the border, and that is not working for us. So my question to Donald Trump will be, how much will be enough? Because before he was in power, uh, we had already thrown money to the border, and that has certainly not improved the situation. So I think we need to think outside the box. We need to be inclusive and be able to sit down and actually fix things. If there's a legitimate system that works immigration-wise, is border security part of that in your mind? Should there be a secure border, either through physical barriers or through patrols, border patrol, customs and border protection? Should there be uh, the ability for Americans, in your view, to stop people who want to cross indiscriminately into the country? I think right now, if anybody wants to cross, and even myself, when I came to the United States, I came with a visa, and I overstayed. Your mom was here. You came to be with your mother. My mom was here a year prior from my arrival, and she had a visa, too. So we both came with a tourist visa, and we both overstayed, and, and it common. expired. This is common. This is common. Uh, was it by design? Did you say, when I get here, I'm staying? My mom's plan was very simple. I, my responsibility was to learn English in one year, and she was going to save enough money so, uh, in one year so both of us can go back to our hometown. That was the original plan. But as you get more restrictive with this uh, mobility of uh, people coming back and forth, I think it's uh, creating, uh, it's firing back. So You're I trapping think people in the interior, right? People come here, then the border security part starts to get tougher, and nobody wants to risk going back and not being able to come back. That is correct. So I think uh, that we need to evaluate what we're doing, really understanding uh, families like me. And, uh, and who knows? I mean, we were, I would have been back in Mexico if everything would have worked out. Becoming a U.S. citizen um, in 2016, has that changed your opinion about any of this? Do you look at this and say, you know, we do have a right to secure our border and know who's here and why? I was undocumented for 12 years. I am now a citizen, but my opinions have not changed. Uh, my mom is still undocumented. My siblings are still undocumented. And for me, this is something that is very personal. And uh, it just makes me want to be a better person I've got 10 seconds. What would you want people to know? I want people not to react by fear and get to know us. Thank you. Good to see you. I appreciate you. Continued success. You're in the real estate business now, right? That is correct. The engineering, you, you were unable to continue with that, but your husband Danny does, so <laughs> yeah. thank you. Don't say Matisse. Matus, thank you for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. Back in a minute. And I want to thank our guests, Carla Moreno and Dulce Matuz, for joining me on Newsmaker Saturday. Very, very interesting perspectives about the immigration issue, which continues to uh, be one of the thorniest issues that we face in America. You can find me on my platforms on Facebook, John Hook Fox 10, on Twitter, same handle. And we will see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday. Thanks for joining us.